So I imagine that every single one of you has a favorite place. It might be a place from your childhood or a place that you love to go to now. It might be a place that makes you feel happy, comfortable, or just safe and loved. And whether you realize it or not, that place actually holds your story, or at least a piece of it. And it's a story you've been adding to since the day you were born. And even though in this day and age, we often think about how our lives take place in the digital sphere, the reality is no matter what we are texting, tweeting, or posting, um, we are always surrounded by physical space. And that space exists as an armature for our stories. Now, I often start um, any introduction of my work with this because when I tell people that I'm an architect, their thoughts immediately go to thinking about, well, what kinds of buildings do I design? And it's true, I, I'm involved in a lot of buildings, um, but I actually prefer to describe my calling as helping to shape the spaces that enable people to live their best stories. Um, I've been doing this work for over 15 years, and uh, one of the things that I've come to realize is that for those of us with privilege, be it race, class, education, access, you name it, um, there's actually an abundance of places that help us live our best stories, whether it's where we live, or where we play, or even where we work. And my work has actually been focused on communities for whom the opposite is true, uh, communities that are surrounded by spaces that seldom support them to thrive. And whether you know it or not, you're actually familiar with those spaces because we tend to have catchphrases for what they are. So it's the ghetto, wrong side of the tracks, or even food deserts. But what you see on the screen is actually what the lack of spatial justice looks like. Now, I don't know how many of you knew what spatial justice was before you showed up today, uh, but I'm gonna explain it to you so we can all be on the same page as part of this conversation. So it's a term that was actually coined by geographers a number of years ago, and it basically means that justice has a geography, and that the equitable distribution of access, services, and outcomes should be a basic human right. And the reality is that in a lot of our cities across this country, we don't have spatial justice when it's possible to see differences in communities where industrial uses ended up and gleaming office towers didn't, where insufficient bus routes occurred and multi-million dollar transit centers didn't, where vacant lots proliferated and nice parks didn't. And we can't talk about injustice in space without also talking about injustice across race and class. Because the truth of the matter is, both historically and still today, black, brown, and poor communities have disproportionately had less access. And sadly, that often has been no accident. I strongly believe that as long as we continue to be separated and selectively harmed by space, then we actually can't heal the wounds of injustice or achieve any of the other justice aims that we're interested in, be it social, economic, racial, et cetera. So with my work as um, founder and principal of Studio O, I basically work at the intersection of racial and spatial injustice, looking every day to figure out how I can actually use design to push us towards spatial justice and hopefully engender some of those other justices that we all want to see. So what I wanted to do with the remainder of my time is show you a couple of projects that give you a glimpse to what that looks like on the ground. So the first project is located in Charlottesville, Virginia, where I've been working for the past four years as part of a redevelopment of an affordable housing development. When you hear Charlottesville, you likely think of the racist rallies and the killing of Heather Heyer in 2017. And while those horrific acts are still something that the community, the broader Charlottesville community is grappling with, the reality is that the wounds of spatial injustice were laid far before then. Um, if we had all the time in the world today, we could go back to slavery, um, but we don't, so I'm only gonna go back 40 years. And um, when urban renewal came to a city as small as Charlottesville, it just so happened to raise Vinegar Hill, which you see an image of on the left, and that was actually the city's most vibrant African-American neighborhood. Um, and that destruction led to not only the displacement of people and their stories, but also the creation of concentrated zones of racial poverty like Friendship Court. 
So Frenchal Court was developed over 40 years ago and has never experienced a significant redevelopment since. It's home to 150 Section 8 families. And when I was brought into the project, one of the things that I always do at the start of every project is make sure that we're actually hearing the stories that are embedded in the place. And in particular, I want to make sure that I'm not only talking to stakeholders with the nonprofit clients or the city, but actually talking to the people who are directly impacted by the harm. And in this case, it was the residents. So I spent a lot of time in living rooms, hearing people's stories, not only about what it was like to live here, but actually what their lives were like in general. Because I believe unless we understand the context of the problem, we can't actually develop a solution in context. And one of the things that I heard is, no matter how different people's stories were, was that there was a consistent thread of pain, of living here and feeling like they were stuck here. And so when we think about what we could do, it, doing good would have meant building new housing to replace this aging housing stock, including the green space that turned into a lake every winter because, of course, this property was built on low-lying land. But if we really wanted to address the painful legacy of injustice, then doing right here had to mean giving power to those who had been most harmed to actually share in determining what a healed future looked like. So one of the earliest things that we did was to actually create a project advisory committee that was made up of elected residents and appointed community members. And we empowered them as co-decision makers alongside the property owner. So they've been helping us make decisions every step of the way of what we were building here. And that has been radically improving the quality of what we've created. And that quality is not just in terms of the physical aesthetics of the place, but actually looking at things like rejiggering the actual economics of what we were doing. So for instance, the original plan was to develop this as Section 8 and market rate, which is kind of the pattern that mixed income developments are going into right now. But residents commented that that would still leave them feeling stuck because it, even though they were co-located, it's a long way away between a Section 8 household and a market rate household. And so we actually rejiggered the economics to add in additional layers of affordability to kind of create a ladder of affordability and hopefully with other programming that we're going to do, allowing people the opportunity to hopefully move up in place instead of having to move up and out. We're also creating, as part of our phase one, an early childhood center that will be open to not only the kids of Friendship Court, but also the surrounding community in a way to try and provide a collective better start. And more recently, we're looking into explorations around wealth creation and home ownership because we've reworked it so we now have a fourth phase where we could build homes. Because one of the biggest things that keeps people stuck and keeps the poor stuck is an injustice that allows them the inability to build generational wealth. So that has now become a key component of the project. The second project I wanted to share with you is located in San Francisco in the historic African-American neighborhood of Bayview Hunters Point. Um, in many ways, it, 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 even though it has a rich history, it's a classic example of spatial injustice. So it was home to many industrial uses, including this power plant. Um, it experienced rampant disinvestment and currently has one of the city's highest rates in unemployment, incarceration, and poverty. All this in a city in which the median home price currently stands at a little over $1.5 million. And I said median. Um, that is 20 times more than the annual median income in this neighborhood. So I've been working on this site that held this power plant. And back in the 90s, a group of mothers living in the public housing on the hill above it actually fought for its closure. They were successful. The utility company tore it down, cleaned the soil, and then capped the bulk of the site with asphalt so that the clean soil wouldn't blow away. The challenge was that because of various issues like land entitlements, lease agreements, et cetera, the site actually was not going to be developed for at least a decade, and actually now we're staring at the possibility that it might be two. When they capped the site with asphalt, it was a 30-acre site. So it meant that you had almost 30 acres of asphalt. That's equal to about 30 football fields. So the utility company didn't want to be the bad guys. Uh, recognizing that they owed the community, they actually put out a call for design teams to propose temporary uses for the site. And I am part of a trio of design firms that responded to that call. And for the past six years, we've been working with the utility company, mothers, and local organizations to program the site with a variety of different uses, doing everything from job training workshops to yoga days to even an annual circus. In the six years that we've been operational, over 25,000 people have come and done something on this site that we hope is meaningfully added to their stories. 
Now, both of these projects have left a lasting imprint in their communities, and they've created something good. But I think it's important to recognize that in communities like this around the country, there's something happening right now where projects are starting to happen and change is being mobilized. And the problem with that is not that there aren't a need for resources in these kinds of projects, but oftentimes they approach as if the communities are blank slates and that by doing something good, we negate the years of doing something bad. And oftentimes that is something that feels very hurtful to community members because it's as if you have ignored their story and an important part of their story, as if zero started today when actually there's a whole history of harm that preceded that. So one of the things that I've been looking at in my projects that I think is now integral to how we talk about spatial justice is this conversation around healing and how do we make that a part of these types of projects as well. And in particular, why I think it's important is because I think when we don't hold space for healing, then actually a lot of times with some of the projects that happen is that we continue to create new wounds in these communities. So for example, in Bayview Hunters Point, what you see on the left is a poster from an ad that was um, for a new development that came up a couple of years ago. And to put it into context for you, the mission um, was the Latino district of San Francisco that jumped the gentrification chart 20 years ago. And so when you have this up there, it basically is a not too subtle code for saying that you want to turn the Bayview into the next mission and basically gentrify it. So for anyone in the Bayview, this is a sign that harm is coming to us. And I'm not going to even talk about the get out moment that's happening on the side. Um, that was like an extra bonus in this ad. Um, but but I, I think, you know, in all seriousness, I think one of the things, even though this is a like highly extreme example, I think it's really important, this idea of that that was even allowed to go forward, that nobody saw that there was anything wrong with that, right? And so that's what happens when we don't talk about the harm that exists in these places and the need for healing that is on all sides, not just the communities that have been impacted by the harm, but the people who have either perpetuated it or benefited from it. So one of the things that we've been trying to do in the Bayview is to make sure that there are places where these stories of the past can actually be acknowledged and be part of the seeds of what we understand that we need to do in the future. So when we first started the project, we actually did a partnership with StoryCorps and we built a listening booth on our site and we invited those who had been involved in the fight to close down the plant to come and tell their stories. And after we recorded a number of stories, we held listening parties where what was amazing about it was not only that it became fodder for people telling both the joyful and the painful stories of the past, but it was almost as if telling those stories allowed them to open a door to having the past be acknowledged and be seen as something of value that then allowed them to look beyond and actually talk about the future in a way that they hadn't been able to before. Many of the things that we heard as part of that event then became the seeds of what we did over the next six years. And they also became part of the permanent fabric of the, the site. So the first permanent piece that's been able to move forward is the Shoreline Park. And what you see up on the screen are actually from some of the interpretive signage that's in the park. Um, on the left, it's actually one that tells the story of the struggle to close the plant. And on the right, it actually includes um, quotes from the StoryCorps recording. And so the idea there is that it's not just that those exist, but it's saying that these people were here and hopefully continuing to have a conversation with anyone who's coming in, whether you lived in this neighborhood before or you're just coming in now. Um, and I'll just close with saying that I think the importance of all of this is that until we can actually start to tell whole stories, we can actually look at the whole picture of what it means to provide meaningful justice in our cities. And so for me, there's a quote by local Chicago activist Charlene Carruthers um, that speaks really well to this. Of when we tell incomplete stories about who we are and where we've been, we have incomplete solutions. So I, I'll just say in closing that I firmly believe that spatial justice is critical if we're actually going to create cities in which everyone's story is actually acknowledged, valued, and nurtured. Um, but I also believe that we can only do this if we all commit to telling whole stories and operating from a place of wholeness. So thank you. I look forward to our conversation.
Good evening. How's everybody feeling after that presentation? It's amazing. Thank you. Um, thank you all for inviting me to be a part of this panel. I'm really looking forward to um, our discussion. I'm just going to set a timer so I try to keep with the time here. Um, I'm going to talk about a couple of projects of mine in the short time that I have, and um, we'll go from there. Cook County Jail is the largest single-site jail in the country. The jail is a pre-detention facility with about 7,500 individuals who've been charged with a crime and are awaiting trial. We know some people wait up to several years due to various causes like the inability to make bail or continuances. And early on, I came to know the jail through my Catholic school's Scared Straight program. I grew up a few blocks away me and my mostly first-generation Mexican schoolmates could tell you about the CCDOC's Division I facility that we toured. We could tell you about the concrete, the beige walls, the iron bars, the men, the smell, the fear. We could tell you about the guards and the detainees, how everyone looked alike, how we looked like them and how they looked like us, how they looked at us, how we looked at them. We could tell you about the way our white teachers were more terrified than us to walk through the facility. We could tell you how the girls in our class were scolded for crossing their legs by the guards, or how they gave us jail food for lunch, a firm bologna sandwich in a brown bag. I wish I could tell you that we had no idea what we were doing there, but that would be untrue. In fact, we were brown kids from the hood, at risk, and our teachers thought we might end up in prison one day. The racialized system of mass incarceration in the US is brutal, as many of you might know. We lock up more people than any other country, about 2.2 million a year. People of color make up 37% of the US population, but 67% of the prison population. Cook County Jail is located within the neighborhood of Little Village on Chicago's west side. It is 96 acres in size, the equivalent to 74 American football fields. Here you can see how a neighborhood of 80,000 residents is viewed from the jail's administration building. The contrast is stark. As an artist, educator, and someone who was active in my community via organizing arts and culture programs, teaching, and as a former muralist, I became interested in developing work inside and outside the jail when I came to realize that the jail was the largest architecture of my neighborhood. And what does that mean? I wanted to know what that meant to live next to a jail. How do people see it? such as when they cross the city from east to west on the number 60 bus, and especially how the jail is simultaneously visible and invisible, the way that local businesses choose to place a summer carnival next to Division I every summer, in which direction are people looking? So I began researching how historically our community has stationed something like the Mexican Day Parade, the floats that are set up on the area's west corridor of the jail's perimeter. Where and how do we celebrate? Who's included and who's not included? These questions and more led to a body of work that I and my collaborators have developed since 2012 through two independent artist-led projects, 96 Acres Project and Radioactive Stories from Beyond the Wall. Both involved a series of collective gestures by way of sound, installation, projection, animation, and performance with those on both sides of this concrete wall. So I'll present just a small selection of work to give you a glimpse as to how we approached um, these projects and what we like to call as site interventions, really exploring the political, social, and psychological qualities of a system of power and the people most impacted by that system, such as young people from a local area interested in tackling the idea of visibility by power washing questions and statements onto the jail's boundary. Here's a short clip. Because this is like a bird graffiti. 
In this same collective spirit, we later crowdsourced 100 cars based on the racial demographics of the jail, therefore collecting 67 black cars, 19 brown cars, and 11 white cars. We partnered with a local radio station to broadcast interviews we collected and asked the drivers to station their cars between the jail and the residential street and tuning into the radio station while blasting the sound as a way to transcend the barrier of the wall. So after several years of producing these site interventions with many community stakeholders, the project went into the interior of the wall, focusing on those currently incarcerated. For one year, a core group of 25 participants, myself and a co-lead instructor, later named the Radioactive Ensemble, developed an audio and visual broadcast using original drawings and audio recordings that we projected onto the jail wall. The ensemble was made up of very tender, sharp, and generous individuals who self-selected to be in the project. Here's a clip of our work together. Through studying the use of metaphor, the potentials of public art, and reflecting on poetry, we engaged in different kinds of speculation, from creating very abstract drawings, to doing performance exercises, to reading the poetry of Asada Shakur, or looking at the work of Avery Gordon and the sociology of architecture. And we created a space within a place of confinement for this um, kind of liberatory action. 
And sometimes that meant collaborating on drawings or recording, and other times that meant dancing to some Chicago house music, essentially turning our small classroom inside this place of detention into a small, discreet, discreet place of possibility and growth. And this is what our um, project led to, which debuted last fall, which was this uh, weekend event um, that we projected onto the geo wall and invited the passerby to just sit and watch and listen. And we partnered with organizations like um, local juvenile justice organizations and, and other partners, other artists that were engaged in um, working around abolition and education. And here's a short clip of our project. So essentially what you heard and saw were personifications of the jail, and the ensemble were asked to choose a specific physical element of the jail's interior and personify it through a fictional narrative. And that was really important because these are people that are awaiting trial, so anything that was recorded could be used against them, so we were really mindful of that. And often what we talked about as a group is um, this idea that, you know, um, art and uh, you know, is not necessarily creating a, a particular kind of solution, but it is a sort of rehearsal. And I think a lot about the work of Augusto Boal, who um, did work around theater of the oppressed, and he talked a lot about how theater may not be the revolution, but it is indeed a rehearsal for it. And, um, and that's really how we thought about this project. Thank you. Thank you. So we're going to spend um, about 20 minutes uh, going to ask some questions, and then we'll have time for the audience to ask as well. Um, so Liz, let me start with you. Um, 
We are in Woodlawn, even though this is Hyde Park days, we're in Woodlawn, and we are in the Logan Center. Um, and so it felt like it would be important to start by just giving some context for the space we're in right now and um, the interactions you've been having with Court Theater and the University of Chicago. Um, one of the things that's very special about the University of Chicago is its relationships with its surrounding communities. And in particular with Woodlawn, and you'd mentioned urban renewal, um, the university had utilized urban renewal as a policy for stabilization when it felt that's uh, a policy it needed to utilize. Um, in relationship to Woodlawn, there was activism and sort of confrontation back with the institution. And so I'm curious from your experience and when you talk about the process of healing, um, even to this present day, there will be people who will share their stories of their experience with the university at that time or experience of displacement. Um, and it's always in the room. No matter how many good things you do, it's always in the room. Do you have examples of institutions who have engaged with community to be part of a process of healing? And how, what was that first step that was taken so that an institution and a community could begin a healing process? Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, and, and I would say, I don't necessarily have an example of one that I feel like is broadly successful, because I think we're all still figuring it out, right? I think the idea that we should even apologize or that we should start to make steps in this direction is actually still a relatively new thing. I think for a long time there was a sense that it was about doing good and as long as we were doing some sort of investment in these places, like that was enough. And I think the kind of activism around sort of saying it's not just about us trying to stop the project or you investing, that, that is where we can stop. We actually have to take it back um, and look a little bit. And I think that that is still something that is still really relatively new in the grand scheme of things, especially as we think about what it means for us to hold all of the stuff. I think there's some interesting stuff happening in Charlottesville right now, actually, um, with the university. Um, and um, this idea of how does it actually repair the harm. And what's interesting, so in Friendship Court, um, even though it's a mile away from the university, we had uh, people who still called the university the plantation. Mm -hmm. um, and we had a lot of people who had never stepped foot mm -hmm. on the university. And so there's some stuff in the university and where they've actually created a racial equity center that is being driven actually by faculty and mm -hmm. students. Um, and that's starting to make some change in some programs. Um, but then we're also, you know, partnering with certain people to do targeted efforts. So there's one where, for the Friendship Court Project, actually, we were able to take advantage of a grant that you can only apply through, through the university to this foundation to get. And we created a youth leadership program. And it was a two-year program where faculty at the university actually created a curriculum for students. Um, and the kids came, and a lot of them, it was the first time that they had ever been on the campus. Campus. And so it was this really interesting opportunity to enable a conversation that had not been happening before because there wasn't any sort of contact. And so I think the thing that I often tell both the communities that I'm working for and um, clients, and I should say that I actually see my clients as also being the community, I always mm -hmm. say I serve mm -hmm. two clients, the mm -hmm. person who pays me and the people that have to live with what I've created. Mm -hmm. And um, the thing that I try to say to all of them is that until we start, this is a slow road. Like, it took decades and in some cases centuries for us to get to where we are now with all of the harm. So the idea that we're going to repair it in a moment or in a year or however long it takes to develop these projects is actually a complete fallacy. Mm -hmm. And so it's really about how are we consistently coming to the table and coming in good faith and being really open about all the harm that exists and how we're all feeling within that, and not just projecting it on the communities that have been harmed. I think sometimes it's really easy to sort of look at the victims and they're the ones who are supposed to share everything. Mm. But the reality is that a lot of us who are on the other side of the table, we're also feeling guilt, we're also feeling some shame, and those are also examples of pain. Mm. So how are we being really real about that and when it, and when it is triggering to us and when we make actions out of trigger, being triggered? So in some ways it's just continuing to show up even when it is uncomfortable and hard, which I know is not the like easy best solution, yeah. but it's kind of the way we need to start moving forward. Thank you. Uh, Maria, um, I'd read about you talking about the, the jail is both 
physically visible, but then incarceration is invisible. I'm curious how um, either the jail guards or community residents responded to the art you were doing because you were giving voice to the folks in the prison, but then also publicly displaying art on the outside of something that folks walk past every day to the point that they may not have even thought about it as a jail anymore. So I'm curious about the reactions of the folks um, who have a relationship to this, this institution, this jail, um, that you were doing this art that was so radical at the time for, for them to participate or not participate in. Yeah, I mean, on a, pract you know, on a practical level, um, you know, similar to what Liz was mentioning earlier in one of her projects, the 96 Acres Project um, had a steering committee. And the steering committee was made up of many different individuals from people that were formerly incarcerated to young people, violence prevention workers, I mean, really many, many different people. And they were really um, tasked with um, you know, thinking about the, the uh, community accountability aspect of the work. So each of the projects that we brought forth um, always went through a process of, of really discussion and kind of filtering. Um, so that was one part of the process. And the other part of the process was then um, presenting these projects to the sheriff's department. Mm. Um, you know, which had to go through its own processes of, you know, considering safety and, and all kinds of other things. Um, so there's sort of that level. On a more sort of, um, you know, everyday uh, level, um, there was a lot of on-the-ground on work, I mean, very kind of grassroots-driven project, really, uh, you know, going to people's houses um, uh, that lived across the street from the jail, um, you know, developing relationships with community leaders, again, that lived across from the jail, and then also... Um, building relationships with some of the staff members. I mean, every day we would go into, you know, the divisions and um, we'd see the same folks um, at the same office, at the same entry point, and developing a relationship with them um, over time allowed us to, I think, do the work that we did. I mean, I think if we didn't have those relationships or those relationships were not, um, you know, I, th if, I think if, if they didn't really understand what we were doing, we would have a lot of issues. And it's not to say that things were always smooth, right? <laughs> I mean, we're talking about a place of detention. Um, but I think that, you know, ultimately it was a place where a lot of our perceptions were challenged all of the time. I certainly came in with a certain set of ideas and I, you know, I came to understand people a bit differently. It, it doesn't, it, you know, I think what, it, what happens is that it, it really dis it really sort of takes away this notion that everything is very clear cut, mm. right? Then you start to understand how the larger system, um, uh, you know, really um, makes people, all kinds of people, depend on it. You know, the fact that this is the largest jail in, um, you know, in, in the country, largest single site, one starts to, of course, and think about you know, economical, um, you know, interests about how many people are, are employed by this institution, um, how many generations of families have been employed by the institution, how many generations of families have been incarcerated in this institution, and you be begin to understand the picture in a more, you know, fuller way. And I certainly didn't come into it with all of these understandings. Like, you know, it, it was really a slow process, and it's one that I'm still understanding. I mean, the system is so complex and so big that I feel like I'm just, you know, I'm sort of just still kind of hitting the tip of the iceberg. Mm -hmm. So let me ask a question of both of you. Um, you both speak about stories and obviously the, the power of those stories to transform, whether it's to heal or to change how you think about something and make it visible. Um, can you speak a little bit more about your own personal story? What motivated you to enter the work that you lead now? Um, what sparked you to do this type of work and recognize healing or recognizing the importance of making folks' voices visible and giving them that platform? Let's we'll start with you, Liz. Sure, so I, I regularly joke that I was the weird child in my family who drew. Um, I grew up in a family of social scientists. My dad was an anthropologist and my mom was a public health educator. So like I grew up talking about people. Mm. And when I got to school, I was really confused why the study of architecture was not, did not have the people part. Like that was really strange mm -hmm. to me. 
Um, and I was fortunate that I, I went to school that allowed me to really design my major. And so I, I basically designed this ability to, to hold both like urban economics alongside how to draw. And I think that continued to be um, the way that I charted my path. And I think I was also informed by the fact that I'm first generation. Both of my parents are from Nigeria. So I was keenly aware of this other life I could have had and the opportunity I had because my parents had come to this country. And so I think that made me also aware as I started to go out in the world that like, you know, through the schools I've been able to go to and, and the various opportunities that my parents made sure I had, I got a certain leg up mm -hmm. that someone else who looked my, like me mm -hmm. didn't necessarily get. And so with that privilege, for me it was super compelling of all, how is it that by virtue of where you were born and what you look like, that you get certain things coming to you? Shouldn't everybody have the right to have a decent space to live and to work? That when we're in spaces that are not great, that they're actually not dignifying for us. They don't recognize our dignity. They don't recognize our humanity. And for me, it just, I could not fathom how we could exist in a world like that. And so a lot of my work has been really about how do I take what I've got and actually use it as a tool mm -hmm. to make sure that other people be able to get the same thing? That's great. Thank you. Maria? Yeah, I'm also a first generation, you know, um, uh, immigrant. My parents immigrated in the 60s to Chicago, and I think that I think that perspective really allowed me to understand community in really profound ways. You know, I... Um, I've, I've come to understand generosity in a way that is, is about survival. Um, it's also about assimilation, the, 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 you know, <laughs> the, the complexities of that. Um, and, you know, I, I think a lot about the harm involved in assimilation, the trauma that generations of, you know, Mexicans and Mexican-Americans have experienced in this country and many other people, of course. Um, and, you know, I think it's that ge the generosity piece. My mom was a school teacher for almost 50 years, Chicago public school teacher, um, very proud of her. And she also was in radio and she was a clown in our neighborhood and she just loved, you know, she loves her neighbors. She loves the people in her neighborhood. And I think that that love um, and that generosity uh, is something that I've always been enamored by. And it's something that I, I feel is really important in building relationships, that it's something just so basic. And so when I work with other people, I, I think about um, those moments of, of, um, of just tenderness that maybe make us more connected to one another. And um, through that lens, though, thinking about issues of belonging mm. and disbelonging and really mm. thinking about who doesn't feel like they belong mm. and, and why is that the case. And in, in, in you know, thinking about visibility and invisibility, I think about that as both a sort of tool and a, um, a weakness, right? That um, who's made to be invisible, uh, who's made to be erased, because that is definitely an aggressive act. Um, but also who maybe feels like they need to be invisible. And I think about that when I think about, you know, the, the, the sheer brutality that the U.S. is doing to immigrants that are currently being locked up in cages with babies. Um, and, you know, thinking about the ways in which, um, you know, visibility and invisibility is really playing a role in our current political situation. Well, that's actually another theme between the two of you. I, I've, I've noticed, I, I want to go back to something from you, Liz, um, in this question of gentrification, which again, in the city of Chicago, there's a lot of conversations and, and um, uh, challenges on. Um, your, why is it that we treat culture, erasure, and economic displacement as inevitable? And um, especially this sort of challenging of developers, architects, policymakers, instead to make a commitment to build people's c capacity to stay in their homes, to stay in their communities, to stay where they feel whole. And so I'd love for you to speak to this question of this, how is your work helping to keep um, communities from being erased, people's stories from being erased, and how do you challenge power? Um, because developers, real estate is about highest and best use. I always think of community development is really about um, benefiting the community residents who are already there. And so those two are oftentimes in tension. 
Um, but talk to me more about sort of this, this bold notion that something should be able to get better and people not lose their home, their space, their stories. Yeah, I mean, I think that the... I feel like there's a lot of stuff in our, our lives where we treat with a certain sense of inevitability, mm -hmm. right? That the system is too big and we can't do anything around, around it. And so this little bit that we do, that's enough. And so for me, I feel when I come in and talk about gentrification and talk about these neighborhoods, the reality is the neighborhoods do need some resources, mm -hmm. right? No one wants to continue to live in a food desert. But we need to talk about how do you do it the right way. And the idea that just because there is investment, that that is enough. It's like we've all seen where that story plays out. And it rarely ever plays out well for the people who've been most harmed. So for the folks who come in and hire me as clients, one of the things that I say to them is that, um, you know, if you're treating this as let's invest and, and create something um, and, you know, if people get displaced or this doesn't work out, like I'm, I'm just a, a developer or I'm a utility company or I'm a nonprofit. There's nothing I can do about this. I'm a little cog within the system. The reality is if everybody thinks that, that's why we have what we have today. And so the idea is it requires one person saying, let me do different. And if multiple people say that, then we can actually get at change. If the investment is just investment for the sake of investment, I qualify that as doing good, which is really about how it makes us feel. Mm -hmm. I gave money to this, I built that, so therefore I can feel good. And really what we should be challenging ourselves is how are we holding us accountable, ourselves accountable to what comes out in the, mm -hmm. in the end, mm -hmm. right? If displacement happens, then we should be accountable for that. And so um, what I do in the projects, and this is why storytelling is so important, is to actually, if we can hear the stories of what has happened in the past, which oftentimes you're not the first person who's coming along saying, I'm going to do this investment, right? These communities have seen it before. If we actually hear what has happened before and actually talk to people and hear what they need, we can actually think through innovative solutions. Mm -hmm. And I think I just try not to be, and I think this is quite interesting about your work as well, try not to be constrained by what, mm. this, what we know has happened and what we believe is possible. I think one of the amazing things about art and design is the ability to imagine something completely different than what our world is, right? Like when you project it on those walls, it was a completely different yeah. rendering of what that space was. And you could sort of then, and I even imagine in the workshops with the men, like in talking, they were thinking things that were even beyond what they thought that they could see as possible. And so for me, starting this, is, I mean, it, it sounds so simple, but it's really like challenging, like, what if we didn't say this is the only path that mm -hmm. we needed to do? What if we said that this wasn't the only outcome that could result? How could we challenge ourselves to ask different questions, to dream in a different way, and to take risks? Like, I think one of the challenges is that the level of risk is, is so narrow. But if we took a little risk, which is about building trust and, and mm -hmm. getting people's stories, we could see something that was different. Yeah. We could see a possibility where it's not there's somebody who's causing harm and there's someone who's being harmed. We mm. can see a possibility in which we both could benefit out of something. Yeah. Thank you. Maria, let's, let's sort of end our part on a, on a positive note. You said uh, <laughs> art as rehearsal. Um, when you were doing the work with, um, with the inmates, with, with the 96 acres, like, what possibilities, what transformation were you able to glimmer or see and be, have, giving a space to create stories and share stories and let them create something. Um, what do you think you were helping them rehearse for? What did they start to feel that it was possible because of the interaction and that space you created that probably felt much more just than the space they were in? On the first day of one of our workshops, I remember you know, introducing the project to the ensemble and I remember one person in particular, who, and we didn't know each other very much, so, you know, we were still building a relationship, and I remember him saying, uh, after I asked, what do you want people to know? What, and we talked about public art and monuments and things like this, and I remember him saying, I want people to know that we're alive and we're charged. And I remember that feeling of, I felt elect, like electricity, you know, and, I, and these are folks that were in recovery programs. And I think that um, often, you know, I think that we deem um, people going through recovery, um, I at least, you know, um, there's this perception that these folks are, um, you know, 
in a way, you know, just they're not around. They're 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 invisible. They're uh, not charged, right? And and I really love the way he said that because it really made me realize that um, there were a lot of um, you know there was a lot of vision and dreaming and um, imagination that was was in that room, and there was just no space for that. And when I you know look when I would walk through the divisions and talk to folks. Um, I know all I would see is a TV, right? And these are people waiting trial. There's a sort of restlessness that happens in, in, in this space. And, and they were looking for something, something to be intellectually driven by, to, to, to do something with their hands. And, and I remember um, Christopher saying, you know, I, I felt a sense of freedom, you know, and, and that's absurd because we're in a place of detention. How is this possible, right? But I think it, it just goes back to, you know, the power of, of creativity and the artistic process. And we got into some funky, weird places, some really abstract places mm. when, when we held our workshops. And those were some of the more interesting moments to me that I can't even articulate exactly what we were talking about. <laughs> that, you know, there were moments where we got so deep into the work that... Um, that this, you know, that I think there was this feeling that, that, that we were all invested in. Um, and I think that's just the sort of feeling of creativity. And the feeling of creativity is, is so powerful. You know, that was liberatory in many ways. Thank you. Um, I'm reading Bell Hooks right now all about love, and she says healing is an act of communion. Mm. And it feels like what your art helps do with the folks you're doing it with is create a sense of communion, mm. and that's part of the healing. Well, um, we can begin to turn it over to audience questions, unless you have a question for each other. Not right now, not <laughs> yet. But later. <laughs> later. Um, so I think we have a mic, and so yeah. perhaps you want to raise your hand if you have a question for our panelists. Absolutely, and before we get started, just a few quick things. Please make sure to speak into the mic so everyone can hear. Please be brief so that we can get to everybody's question, and please pose your question as a question rather than a statement. Go ahead and raise your hand and I'll come to you. Let's start right down here. Thank you both for your work. Um, the problems that you're trying to resolve are huge. It's overwhelming hearing about them. And I'm wondering, just from the work that you've done so far, what do you see as the outcomes in the communities, um, like Maria in the in Little Village? What was the reaction to your to your project, and then in Liz in your redevelopment work? Um, can you talk a little bit about the reaction? Yeah, I mean, I think um, you know the community is not a monolithic space. Um, you know, we know that communities are highly complex um, places, and not everybody was. Uh, interested in a critique of the institution or thinking about ways of imagining something else on those 96 acres. Um, some people, um, actually many people were, um, but some weren't. And so there, there was always some sort of tension. There was also tension around the forms that we were using. So for example, I think early on, most people thought we were going to be doing murals mm -hmm. on the wall. We, this is, you know, and and um, shout out to the mural movement of Chicago, right? <laughs> we're, we're, we're strong in that sense, and I, I come from that practice. But there were these really uh, interesting issues that arose from thinking about what that would look like. For example, the wall is, um, has layers of cement parchment. So in order for us to produce a mural, let's say, we'd have to reinforce the wall, and we didn't want to do that. And so there were these interesting problems that came up. There were also... Uh, questions around beauty and mm -hmm. notions of beauty. And I thought that was really interesting because I think a lot about how often when we're working within, um, you know, communities of color or uh, marginalized communities, etc., cetera, um, we often don't think about aesthetics mm -hmm. as being, you know, an integral part of a community's identity. But obviously people had a real stake in what they felt the aesthetic of a neighborhood was. And so, you know, um, coming in, well, I'm from the neighborhood, so that 
there's that, but you know, really thinking about it from an artist's perspective and thinking about it from um, a, a, a much sort of richer perspective, a much more larger community perspective, it created some very uh, interesting conversations. I would say that most of the time the, the outcome was very positive and people were very interested in what we were doing. Um, so. And I think uh, it's hard to answer the question because it's, it, the, the reactions are mixed. So in a way from the immediate things that are generated, whether it's the process in Charlottesville and the plan that has emerged or in Hunter's Point, the activations that are occurring in the shoreline, like I could go on and on of like specific things that have been created in the projects. At that immediate level, the reaction is really positive. People feel like there has been a process or spaces that honor them where they can see themselves, they can see their stories. There are relationships built with the various stakeholders that didn't really exist before. You know, I have a project in East Palo Alto where people have come out to the community meetings or to the city council meetings to speak on behalf of the developer, which never mm -hmm. happens, right? So in the one hand, we've achieved some success within that, but I think it's important to also hold the long arc of everything that is informed, and so there is still often a lot of pain and a lot of tensions, and sometimes you can go two steps forward and one step back, right? And so I think it's important that I feel, I feel pride, and I think people mm -hmm. in the communities feel pride over the things we've been able to create, but we also are all keenly aware that we have such a long road to go, and I would say, you know, I just did a round of interviews in Charlottesville, and there was such deep pain about, we're about to break ground on the first phase and everybody's excited about this new place that they'll get, but there's also such deep pain of, but what happens in 10 years, mm -hmm. right? Will I still be here? Will I still be struggling to pay for daycare? Will I be still looking at my bank account and not seeing anything there? And so it's, it's holding space for that that still exists and so we gotta keep on working because that is our longer project, right? Um, one where they would be seen with dignity and actually get to live the life that they want to live. Mm -hmm. So I try to hold both the small victories, but also not take my eye off of that like ultimate aim that we need to work for. We've got a question right down there. Jeff, do you mind bringing the mic to her? Thank you. My question is for Maria. Um, you provide like a space for people in jail to sort of like free themselves with art. What is the long-term process like when you leave them and I guess they were, if I were them, I would be really sad not to have that anymore. So what is your project in that regard with them? Are you going to continue working with them in a different fashion? What, what is the plan here? Yeah, so for, for radioactive, um, so since the jail is pre-detention, um, men, I, I think all of the men now have either been, um, they're either out or some have been transferred to prisons. Um, and we are still in communication. Some of the core group members are still in communication. Um, after, so some of what you didn't see in the video clip that, that is in the video clip if you go online is that um, after we finished the project at the jail, there was a lot of post-production. There was a lot of um, figuring out the sequencing of the drawings, voiceover, things like this. So some of the ensemble members that had uh, come out of the jail continued working with us and we kept meeting and looking at the work and thinking about some of those, um, some of those things like sequencing, etc. Um, you know, sadly, not everyone has, uh, you know, has had a sort of success story, you know. Um, um, there's been a couple folks that have gone in and out since then, and we've tried to be in touch, but it, it, it's also sad for me, you know. Like, we're, I feel like we all were sad to finish the project together because we didn't know what the future looked like. And, um, you know, I, I, and I can't speak for them, but I think, probably more for them, right? And because they had to sort of figure out the logistics of where to return uh, to, what, what, you know, what is their housing situation like, really basic things that I, I would take for granted. Um, 
The other piece to this, though, is, you know, we tried to be really clear with the project. So, um, you know, we tried to be really clear about the, the goal of the project and what the outcome would be and, um, and that the project would end at that time. And so, you know, something I've had to think a lot about as an independent artist is um, the capacity of a project. Um, and, you know, when is it... Uh, better to sort of partner with other organizations, for example, that are, that are doing some other kinds of work, um, or, or, you know, what does a structure of an art project within a jail look like that would be very different from a prison? Because in the jail, you might have somebody there in your project for two weeks, or you might, they might be there for several months. So there's so many unknowns within that system, and so that was one of the challenges of running a project there that has continued on since then. I will be doing a project again, um, I hope, next year, um, though, with a different group of people. Got a question right back here. This is a question for both of you. What's the source of your funding? Mm -hmm. um, so for me, it's, it's varied. So I like to say that I am client agnostic. So, you know, currently I have a for-profit developer, a non-profit developer, a utility company, a city, a theater, and a museum as my clients. Um, so, and they're pulling funds from a lot of different places. Sometimes it's um, philanthropic support, sometimes it's things that they've raised through, through other projects. Um, so, uh, yeah, and, and for the ones where it's a smaller group that is not as financially secure. I sort of operate on a cross-subsidy model, so for-profit developer is paying to help subsidize me to work with um, the clients who don't have as much money but have just as much, if not more, need. Um, all of the funding that, um, that I get is from arts foundations. So no, mon no money came from the county, for example. Um, the Rauschenberg Foundation um, started a fellowship around arts and activism that's no longer in existence, but they were a major funder for the Radioactive Project. There's a question over there. Oh, right over there. Hi, thank you all for being here. Um, I had a quick question about, uh, I'm an urban planning student, and so I'm curious about what the best practices are for building trust in a community that you're working in, whether it's uh, you know a place you've never lived before, a different neighborhood, and just like how does that sort of vary project to project? And especially since it takes so long to, you know, people heal at different rates and traumas sort of are, some are surface, some are deep. How, how does it vary sort of uh, project to project? Um, so, I would say first and foremost, it's about active listening. Like, even though I grew up in Oakland and the Bayview is across the bay, it's still a radically different neighborhood. So, I could know about the history of the Bay Area, but still not actually know the history of the Bayview in that deep way. So, you know, in that project, the first thing we did is we went and looked up all the folks who'd been involved to close the power plant, and I went, sat in coffee shops, living rooms, wherever they wanted to meet, and, you know, they were supposed to be one-hour conversations, they often went three. Uh, just because I think, and you could say this for almost any of us in this room, we so rarely have somebody who's just there to listen to us. Right? There's no agenda other than I like just want to hear your story. And, and so it's a really powerful thing if you are intentional about communicating that. And I will listen to you as many times as you want to talk to me. And I really, I'm, I'm not listening to extract the data that I can then go and do this thing. I'm listening because I genuinely want to know you and I'd like at some point for you to know me. And so, um, you know, one of my favorite stories from the Hunters Point project is uh, you know, when we did the StoryCorps thing, it works, you come in pairs and you interview one another, and there was a, um, a couple that came in, and I had talked to the husband, but he clearly had not talked to his wife about what this thing was. So she came in and she was like, I don't want to tell you my story, I don't want to sit in this booth, and so I said, look, let me interview both of you, and she's like, okay, but we can only talk about the plant, I don't want to tell any story about my family. And by the end, because I'm just listening and going wherever the conversation goes, 
she was showing me the pictures of her grandbabies and we were talking all about that because I wasn't just asking about the plant, but I was just asking about her life. And I think that's another thing is like, don't ask just the questions that relate to the project. Act as if you're actually just, you're meeting a new friend and you would really love to get to know them. Um, and you know, a couple months later I saw her and I was like, hey, how are you doing? And I'm always going and you know, whether it's I need something or not, I'm going to ask you about how you're doing. And she, it happened to be the anniversary of the day her son died. Mm. And I totally had places to go, but I was like, you need someone to listen to you as you share out now. So I am here for how long, ever long it takes you to share that story. Um, so it's, it's doing that and continuing to show up and continuing to show up open-hearted and authentic. And then the other thing, which sometimes my clients are not always so happy about, is I also believe in radical transparency. So like being super transparent about what you're doing and what you need, um, what's going to be done with that information, and sort of treat, like, treat the act of design as an actual conversation. So if you've told me something, I go and I figure out whether or not it can be done, and I come back and tell you. And if I can't do it, I actually explain why it can't be done. Um, but I make the process as transparent as possible. And I think oftentimes we put design or these things into a black box, or we do the community meeting, and then we go away, and nobody knows whatever happened with that thing. And I think that's part of where the seeds of distrust start to happen. Um, and then the final thing is, um, when making moves, instead of, I think, sometimes with these projects, because there is so much need, we, make, we wait to do these big, gigantic moves that take forever to actually reach fruition, when actually if you just make these small steps that somebody can see tangibly, that there is a reaction to something I said or that we're moving forward, it can actually be super meaningful. So I often look for, and it's on both sides, right? Both for the person who's funding the project, but also the folks who are impacted by it. So I often look for what are those small bites that we can sort of test these ideas out together. Um, yeah, I, I absolutely agree, and I think that um, I, the piece that I said earlier about uh, not coming in with this notion that the community is monolithic, that they all agree on this one thing, I think that's really important. And um, to value local scholarship, that there are you know, local experts that um, have a history and knowledge of a community that um, you may not read in a book, or there is no data on it, and I think that can only really um, happen if you have a conversation. I did a recording with somebody inside Cook County Jail and just speaking of the, the act of listening and also bearing witness, um, he recorded his story, I want to say like five times and it was an hour long each time. And I knew early on and, and we talked about this that it would be impossible for us to include that piece in the final work. And uh, it was just sort of logistical. And, and what happened is he just wanted somebody to listen and to have it recorded many times. And we had to come in like extra weeks to keep doing it. But I think that that alone was so powerful to, to, to hear him and to hear, you know, the, the, the stories he had, the trauma he experienced as a child and how that sort of developed over time. And that act was, was so meaningful um, to us, and, and I think that, that just really went to show how important just the act of listening and recording. And, and I have the recording, we didn't use it, and I have it for him whenever he wants it, but it's, I'm, I'm just sort of holding it right now. We have time for one last question. Let's go right down here. Questions for Liz. I'm interested in the um, uh, the decision making process with regards to your clients and what if there's any commonalities they may have in choosing a firm like yours as opposed to a more traditional firm. And if there's any kind of if there is some commonalities, how we can kind of implant seeds within our own communities with our aldermen or other developers that are trying to pitch projects to kind of consider uh, the, the things that you're kind of trying to implement. Um, so that we can kind of act on these things. Yeah. So um, generally, my clients are those who have tried to do things uh, business as usual before, and it hasn't worked, or for whatever reason, have lost faith in, in that way of moving forward, and have a sense that there there could be a way to do this differently and to do it better in doing that difference, and that there's. Um, you know, and it's on varying levels, but there's a genuine interest in actually addressing these issues of justice and addressing some of the harm. 
And so they kind of walk in the door with that a little bit. Some of them maybe think they're more on that road than they actually are. But um, I think that willingness to question the normal way in which you do things is an important precondition for me. Because I think if you're coming in and expecting me like to do community engagement the same way we've always done it, where we'll hold like three community meetings and won't that be great? Um, and we'll present to them and maybe we'll have some posted exercise. It, like that's just not going to work. And especially because a lot of my process involves very early on that we spend a lot of time talking. So while you may have thought that we'd be, be putting pen to paper right now, I'm like, no, we, we still have more to, to learn. So I think that's, that's an important ingredient. Um, I think also when I talk about the trust that I try to build with members of the communities that we're working in, I actually do the same things with my clients, right? Like I think a lot of times why they shy away from projects that seem more like social good projects is it feels like they're just going to get die in the die in the wool community activists who are only about the community, rah, 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 and don't care about business or any of that stuff. And it's like, in order for the system to change, we all have to change. So I spent a lot of time actually trying to understand what it is that they're looking for, what is seen as success in their world, partly for understanding what do we need to do to translate it to work for them, um, but partly also that offers me the levers of innovation just as much as the stuff I might hear in conversation with various community members. So, for example, the utility company, um, for the core team, we had a member who actually grew up in the community. And I also think sometimes when you have somebody who has a super personal relation to what's happening, that's also a great lever. Um, but for their bosses, they're like, I don't understand what you're doing. We're an energy company. Like, we just do energy. This community development stuff is crazy. And we were able to say that, well, normally you would do site, after talking to them, we understood that normally on a site like this, they would have a site management strategy where they would be putting up fencing so nobody could access the site um, and paying for a security company and doing all of these things and getting calls from the mayors because people are angry about the land being va vandalized. And we were able to say, uh, well, actually, in this case, we actually have stewardship from the community over the site. Nobody's calling the mayor except to be like, this is an amazing thing that's happening here. And so even though it's community development to us, the way it needed to be understood by the bosses at this utility company was as a site management strategy. Mm -hmm. So it's like also understanding what are the acts of translation that need to happen. Like, it's not that always that somebody doesn't want to do anything, it's that they don't understand the language that you're talking in. And so I treat it as part of my work to actually figure out how to do that. And then how to also make sure that I can de-risk failure. So that's part of where doing these quick little things comes in, is that it allows all of us to see a win really easily, or if we fail, it's like a contained thing that it's like, it's like a scratch, we're all okay, we can continue moving on to the next step. Um, and then the final thing that I often do with a lot of clients is I will only um, commit initially to a small scope of work, mm. because I believe it's important that we're building a relationship and we understand whether or not we can work together. Sometimes people just aren't ready to take that risk and that's okay, um, but we should be able to walk away from that, like consenting adults. So, um, you know, those are a couple of tips. That's great. Um, I would like to thank Liz and Maria for their generosity and their art and their work. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>